Good morning, everybody. It is around 1130 on Wednesday, and thank you for joining Boundary Systems webinar Wednesday. We are going to wait a few more moments and give a couple people um, a little bit more time to arrive, and we will check back with you in just a minute. Good morning again, everyone. My name is Nicole Daringer with Boundary Systems. I have 1132 on my clock here, so we are going to go ahead and get started with our webinar Wednesday presentation. Today, our webinar will be presented by one of our partners, Sigmetrics. Stephen Wurst, the Director of Customer Success and Product Strategy, will be presenting CTOL Six Sigma, which is a SOLIDWORKS certified gold product solution for 3D tolerance analysis. Stephen will be happy to take questions excuse me, throughout the presentation, but please use GoTo's question panel to do so as you will be in listener-only mode throughout the dur um, duration of his presentation. With that, I will turn it right over to Stephen. Well, thanks, Nicole, and welcome, everyone. I appreciate you spending uh, an hour today to, to look at uh, the software and, and to see if it would be a good fit uh, for your needs. Um, a quick overview of what we plan to talk about. I'm gonna have a single slide about our company, the history, um, and, and our solutions for SOLIDWORKS. <clears throat> and then I'll have another slide where we kind of introduce the model that we're gonna use. You may have actually seen it. It's actually from one of uh, SOLIDWORKS tutorials. We've modified it a little bit, but uh, you should recognize it if you've gone through the tall analyst tutorial. And we'll do, um, show you a, what we're gonna study, one of three things, and show how most people would go about doing that today uh, with our, you know, I would say our number one competitor in the market, that is uh, Microsoft Excel. So we'd show that and then we'll jump into the software to show how the, we would do that same analysis within CETOL. And then we'll get into, again, the, the overview of the model within the uh, SOLIDWORKS environment. We'll do the first analysis, improve the design, actually add probably two more in there to show some other capabilities of the software, generate a report, and then talk about all the useful ways that this data can be uh, used in production. So it's not just a tool for the design team, it actually provides value during the production phase of a, of a product of a program. And then we'll end it up with a Q&A session. All right, so Sigmetrics has actually been around since 1999. We're celebrating our uh, 20th anniversary in a few weeks, actually. Uh, in fact, our marketing person is about to send out a, a, a flyer or a, an ad or a broadcast talking about uh, the, the legacy of the company. Um, we have several products in our portfolio. Our flagship product, though, is CETOL Six Sigma. This is a full 3D tolerance analysis solution that works directly with your CAD geometry, and it supports multiple uh, CAD models. What we're going to be talking about today, of course, is SOLIDWORKS. And, and as Nicole noted, we are a certified gold pro partner product, and so we actually are the only one uh, in, this, uh, in this realm of, for doing 3D analysis that has that certified gold uh, designation. Um, the technology actually started before the company was formed. Uh, it stemmed from uh, TI Defense Systems that later got sold to Raytheon. And actually that development effort started in the early 90s. So even though the company itself of Sigmetrics is, is 20 years old, uh, the software actually has almost another decade on top of that. Not quite. <clears throat> the next, <coughs> excuse me, the next, <coughs> sorry, next product in our portfolio that I'll just mention is EasyTall. This is very much a 1D tolerance stack up tool. Uh, it can work with, again, CAD files from many different sources, including SOLIDWORKS. And it, and it really um, is, is 
is intended to, to, to look at 1D stack ups only. What, again, people traditionally do in, in spreadsheets. Beyond our software, well, we actually have GDNT Advisor. This is actually a tool for authoring and uh, correct and complete GDNT. It is, I would say, equivalent to the DIM Expert tool now called the MBD tab in SolidWorks 2019. This isn't for other CAT systems, but I do mention that this is some of our uh, forte as well. Around all this, we offer services both in terms of consulting and, and how to, to, to use the tools and, and, and you know, design parts with dimensional variation in mind, how to apply GDNT, of course, and then train in the, in the various topics. So we are, again, offering this suite of uh, products, software products and services in the realm of dimensional management and understanding how dimensional variation impacts the performance of your designs. So the model that we'll be using today is this, again, this caster wheel. This is taken from the one of the tile analyst tutorials. And I've, again, I've made a few, a couple modifications. I added some GD&T in there so that we could actually pull in this data um, for the analysis rather than having to have you watch me put the data into CTAL. We'll talk about that in a minute. But what we'll be studying initially is the gap, which you can't see here, but you see the two surfaces highlighted. And you see that I've used the measure tool to, to, to verify that within SOLIDWORKS as modeled nominally, there's one millimeter between the face, left face of the wheel and the right face of this bushing that gets pressed into this support arm. And so of course, in order for the wheel to, to serve its function of spinning, allowing whatever this thing is attached to to roll, this distance needs to be, be at least greater than zero. Uh, if it's not, then this is not going to roll very well and it's not going to serve its intended function. On the right hand side, you see a spreadsheet analysis, a very simple stack up. I don't know, uh, let me move this up just in case it's covering the results. <clears throat> the, uh, the of, of how we would, might go in and analyze this. And so, you know, starting from the wheel, working our way through the, through the bushing, the support arm, the bolts, and, and completing the loop on the left hand side. That's what the spreadsheet reflects. Here I put in the nominal distances for all of these, where all these features are on the parts, along with the geometric tolerances were applicable, in which case most are. And then of course, uh, the equivalent plus or minus variation. So when we do a worst case analysis, and that's all I'll focus on for the spreadsheet, we see that um, after converting all the dimensions in, uh, to, to their kind of their midpoint, the, the, if it, they're not equal bilateral, then the way that this was done was to, to find the midpoint of the tolerance call that the nominal. So there's a just, you know, little, there may be a difference between what we see as the nominal in the spreadsheet versus the, the way the, the parts are modeled in uh, SOLIDWORKS. But mathematically, we see that the gap is 1.7 millimeters, just under 1.7, with a plus or minus worst case of 1.3. So clearly, this is not going to ever go to zero. In fact, we were always going to have a, a pretty nice gap here. One thing I'll point out, why do we have a difference between 1.699 and the one millimeter in SOLIDWORKS? Two reasons, one I just explained, you know, we're, we're converting these to equal bilateral. So if I have a asymmetric tolerance, then, then there is a change there. But also notice in the description that what I'm doing here, what the assumption I'm making is that th these arms have clearance holes for the bolts to go into. And so for this analysis, I've assumed that those arms get pushed, this one to the right and this one to the left, as far as is possible. Basically assuming that the, the person who assembled these parts are going to take that action before tightening the bolts to ensure that the gap is going to exist and the wheel is going to spin. So that's, again, that's what this is analyzed. That's what has been documented. And that's what we'll do in the software as well. All right, so let's jump into the software. And I'm going to move this down. I think that'll be a good place. I did have the <coughs> the add-ins dialog <coughs> open to start with just to show you that we do run as an add-in directly within the SOLIDWORKS environment. I've loaded it, but you have full control over when this does or doesn't get loaded. When it's active, when it's loaded, you'll see the CE tall uh, tab in the, in the ribbon in the toolbar on the top. Now, the program has started, but we have not yet initialized that. We have not yet looked at uh, data that, that may exist. And there's different sources where we can save the data. By default, we save it in your SOLIDWORKS files. We also have, and that we have two options there as well as options for saving it um, externally. So if you don't want to, to touch your files with this data, then you can actually save it as an external file and load it in later. 
On the left-hand side, you see the CE tall tree. We add that to the same area where you have your SOLIDWORKS assembly tree. And so you can, if I didn't want to see the assembly tree, I could completely, you know, close this pane down or I, have, I could have both open at the same time. Um, again, tight integration to let you have maximum flexibility in how you want to manage these views. Right now, the tree is empty. So from a, even though I have things in SOLIDWORKS, I don't have those, those items in CE tall yet. So with the tool and the workflow, you're only going to pull in the parts that you need to do your analysis. Uh, so if you have a big complex assembly and you're only looking at part of it, then you don't need that full detail here of, of all the parts in the assembly. All you're really going to want to look at are the things specific to the analyses you, you have you know, that you're going to run. On the right-hand side of the window, you see the properties dialog. So as we select different items uh, within the tree, the properties will show up. You'll have some options here to, to make adjustments. So this is a kind of a general symbol scaling to make things a little bit bigger so they're easily seen. And in the lower right corner is the, the area where the tool helps the user, guide the user through the process. So throughout, and you're gonna be referring to this quite a bit, so this is always going to excuse me, provide feedback to the user on what might be missing, what the next steps might be. Um, here, we, when we start the tool, um, it's in an, in our, in our first tab, it's going to give us in, information that there aren't any measurements yet. So just, to, just guidance on things the user should be aware of in terms of the state of their analysis model definition. The tools themselves are, again, in the ribbon. We have the, uh, th this is basically three steps of the workflow. The first is to define the assembly model. So we have the tools required to do that here. We have the tools to define the dimensioning scheme. If you need to do that within CETOL, if you can't pull that data out of the, the CAD models, and today I'll be pulling most of that out of the SOLIDWORKS files. And then we have tools to run the analysis and see the results. So again, the the, placement of the tools, the filtering of the tools, all of this is aligned with the workflow and, and trying to make it easier to come back to use the software because we know that people don't use tolerance analysis software every day. Now, I'm actually going to get started. Instead of adding my measurement, what I want to go ahead and do is pull these components into my CE tall assembly model definition. And I'm going to do that by just adding the component. <clears throat> now, each time I add something, uh, you'll see uh, a little, and as I get more and more, you'll see a little bit of a delay before the control comes back to add the next one. Now we do, it is a one step at a time, one part at a time, because again, we want you to provide input to the tool on what is and isn't important for the analysis so that we're not just pulling in a bunch of stuff that's unnecessary and making it harder to work with and, and, and manipulate. And as I add these components, you'll see over here on the left, details adding. So not only is a, 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 the name of that component coming in, but these little purple and yellow icons are also being added. Well, these icons refl reflect what we call joints. So it, you can actually add them manually. In this case, they're getting created automatically. Where does the information come from for that automatic creation? Your SOLIDWORKS mate definitions. So if you have assembly constraint data, functional assembly constraint data, in your SOLIDWORKS models, and by that we mean surface to surface types of relationships, like how what would actually control the parts in the real world, then we can utilize that. So you don't have to replicate that in our environment. Of course, in the event that you don't have that information, we do of course let you add those functional relationships, i.e. what we call joints, mates in SOLIDWORKS, directly within, uh, within CETOL. All right, so, I'm Proceeding along on this last one, I'm going to make a couple of edits on the joints uh, that came in. And so, you know, again, we can, we're pulling it in from the CAD model. I'm making some adjustments because they may be a little bit different for the functional definition for the way they were modeled. And if I at any point I have a question on how far I've gotten, uh, we have a quick visualization tool where I can quickly see what's in the model and what's not. So most of what I need is in here. Let's go ahead and add the wheel. <clears throat> so once I add the wheel, and it comes in. I've, I've completed the model definition. You can see on the left, there are a lot of things that have been added, parts, joints, uh, and then underneath a part, I can expand it and see on a bushing specific features that were added. So not only is it <clears throat> adding the, the using the mate definitions to create the joints, but any features that are referenced by the mates are also brought in. 
as well as the tolerance information on those features. So within those few clicks, I have a pretty complete model on which I can define a lot of studies. Now, on the right-hand side, notice I have some messages. I have some informational messages. I have a state one message saying no measurements. That's what I had to begin with. Well, let's go ahead and take care of that because you know we, we pulled this in for a reason. So let's go ahead and add the measurement. I'll zoom in. So I wanna select the interface of that bushing. And now I'm getting the verification of that that's been selected and then the, the outer or the left face of the wheel. And that's gonna be my axial gap. And this is gonna be a gap measurement. And I said what I want, and you can see visually the um, arrows are indicating what it is that I'm studying, the, the variation of in the assembly. And so I said that I wanna make sure that that's gonna be greater than zero. So I'll set my lower limit to zero. And I don't really care what my upper limit is. I'll send it to five right now. All right, so now we have the measurement defined and notice the message goes away. We also have some informational messages here that I will come back to. Let's see if there's anything of more severity. There is. I have a, a warning that something has happened on one of the parts. So let's go ahead and take this opportunity to save this. And I'll drill down a little bit. I can, at any point, if I don't, so this, this italics means that it's summarizing several, one or more messages that may be occurring at a different point of the workflow. So this is a part level message, which would imply that it's probably something at the dimension level. So if I right click and say, let's fix this or double click, it selects the dimension. It gets me kind of in the part mode, still have a summary. So once again, I'll double click and I'll see I have some issue with axle support. So to really see what's happening here, rather than doing it the assembly, what I'd like to do is open this in the part itself and let's kind of see what we're working with. So you see here's a PMI that's been added. Uh, this, I, this was actually added through the MBD or formerly DIM expert module, though it doesn't have to be. You can actually insert annotations directly with this tool and we can use that as well. So what CETOL sees about this? So this is fully annotated, but in terms of what's happening in the message, the C tall is saying that this hole and this hole says two feature variables are unconstrained. If I have a question about what that means, I can select help. I get context sensitive help about what does the unconstrained variables of a feature mean, it explains it, talks to about different solutions about adding dimension, adding geometric tolerances and so forth directly within the help system. Again, trying to make it easier to come back to the software if you haven't used it in a while. Well, if we interrogate that hole and we see over here on the right hand side what are unconstrained so we show here the constraint the the the, the degrees of freedom of a hole a cylinder that need to be constrained and the ones that are not are rx and tx or ry and tx as depicted on this coordinate system so we have a position why isn't it controlling tx and ry well let's take a look at it the position that was read or that was used is here. You can see it highlighting if I, that's the position. So we, we've we we've read that in and I can, I know that we're, you know, we've not only read it in cause I didn't add it in C at all using one of these tools, but the green dot actually tells me that we're linked. <clears throat> so, which means is if I change, make changes to the tolerance values here, you know, they're gonna be pushed back into the annotation, presumably shown on the drawing as well. That's what the green dot is. The link is established. But why the error? Well, if you've been looking at this and while I talked, hopefully some of you have identified there's something missing in this feature control frame. I made a mistake. Basically, I'm controlling a hole, but I don't have a cylindrical tolerance zone. I only have a width because I forgot to put the diameter symbol in. That's why the tool is complaining that that hole is not fully constrained. Well, that's easy enough to fix. I could do this in SOLIDWORKS and update C tall, or I can just say, let's make this a diametral tolerance zone. Notice the messages go away. Diameters put on the annotation. Problem solved. We're ready to go back to the assembly. All right. So let's start again from the assembly or refresh the assembly. And we'll take a look at the other messages that we have because they may be relevant. Remember in my 
spreadsheet, I said I wanted to push the arms out as far as possible, right? And if I look at the axial gap here, it's at one millimeter. So this state, which we actually used to call configurations, and that was actually part of what we needed to change uh, when we went from a certified partner product to, to that gold level, is you know we can't have conflicts in names. So we don't use the term configurations anymore. We call them assembly states. And this assembly state, what I'm defining here, the position of these parts, is the arms pushed out. Okay, that's what I want to about to go do. Now, I I know I need to do that, but I also want to point out that the tool is telling me with these informational messages that it's found clearance between, in this case, <clears throat> highlight again, the clearance hole and the threads of the bolt. CTOL defaults to these types of mates, these types of joints to be, have them be centered. But if it detects clearance, then it will throw this message or show this message to the user to say, are you sure this is what you want? Because in the real world, when you have clearance between parts, coaxiality is usually not going to occur, right? And so in this case, I want to bias these things out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, I'm going to bias them in the Y direction. So I want to point Y to be consistently out and say they contact on the negative Y side. And you see the little yellow sphere to indicate where that contacts. I'll do that to the next one. Notice that first message goes away. When I do that again to this one and do tangent minus Y, that message goes away. Now, if it had ever detected interference here, that message would be shown now because if I'm doing something other than center and interference occurs, well, that's something I should know as well. Just to do a quick verification that the parts are actually gonna be pushed out, I do a show locations and you can see the arm move to the right ever so slightly, taking up that nominal clearance between the bolt and the hole. All right, let's go do the same thing on the other side. So I'll reorient the joint, the Y axis, because we always bias in Y and say, I want a tangent, make that tangent Y negative and do the same thing here. Okay. So, and once again, I can verify that I've made the proper selections by zooming in, making sure both sides are coming out evenly and so forth. So the, the visualize uh, show, show locations tool is really handy to make sure I haven't selected something inadvertently. I have messages about clearances between the shaft and the bushings. Well, that's good. Otherwise they wouldn't spin. And the wheel and the shaft. Well, that's okay. It's actually held on with the set screw. So that's expected. Right now, I don't need to worry about these. I can filter those out. No warnings, no errors. I'll go ahead and keep them on because in a minute, I'll deal with those. So we're ready to go run this analysis. So, I'll, well, I can either run it from here and say solve, but let's go ahead and go show you the tools in the analyze. I'll go ahead and solve up here. This will solve everything that is available. It'll show me that list. We'll see more of this in a minute. And I'll do some quick calculations. <coughs> and it's done. So let's go look at those results. I'm going to move that over here. Let's make it a little bit smaller. All right. Now, what do we have here? So the tool automatically does both the statistical and worst case. The statistical is, is given by this distribution curve. And you have full control over the assumptions that go into it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that today. Right now, I'm assuming every time I enter a tolerance, I'm assuming that the standard deviation is one third the distance from the, the mean to the upper or lower range, the CP of one. And so that's the assumption going in, but that has can be fully edited or changed and controlled by the user at the app level, the part level, individual feature level. Taking that assumption, you know, with the distribution of all the inputs and looking at those statistical characteristics of the output, this thing looks really good. It looks from a statistical, statistical perspective, the probability <coughs> of this gap ever going to zero is, is very small. So, and, and you see here the characteristics of the distribution, the mean standard deviation, quality metrics, there's a total of nine you can choose from. I've just selected three that are kind of the more popular here. <clears throat> What's actually a little bit more interesting about this analysis are the worst case results. Now, these are actual worst case, all right? These are just like if you were to develop the equations and be, do each one at the min and max, but just like we did here, right? This is an actual worst case result. This is not the min and max of some Monte Carlo simulation run. This is you know, the different algorithm. All right. Now, this said we we're going to be good, right? This said we're always going to be greater than zero. 1.699 minus 1.341 is not zero or less. But CE Tall is saying we're quite a bit 
into the range of, of uh, potential interference. So now the question is, well, why is that? I've, I've done a spreadsheet analysis and, you know, I, without double checking my numbers, it is accurate. But but now CETOL is telling me something's different. So it's, is it, you know, do I question its accuracy? Not at all. Okay, the one the spreadsheet was typically a 1D analysis where we looked at variation horizontally. CETOL is a 3D tool. What I suspect, and we'll, we'll see in a minute, is this is exposing there may be more than the 1D nature of the problem assumed in the spreadsheet. Let's see. Whenever we have a question about the results uh, of the of the analysis, in this case, the worst case results, we have visualization tools to help us understand visually what the numbers are trying to communicate. And so here I wanna see what is the position of the parts from one worst case limit to the other. You notice that when I hit, you know, recalculate, it kind of pushes those things arms out, like I said I was trying to do. So that's good. But when I animate this, watch the watch the motion. Watch the movement. Hopefully everybody sees something a little bit more than everything on the right hand side underneath the top plate being moved, translated to the right, and everything on the left hand side being translated to the left. That was the assumption in the spreadsheet. That was what typically when people use spreadsheets, they'll, they'll do it as a quick 1D stack up and I would venture to guess that most people would do that with this one as well. However, you can also see from this visual that there's some rotation going on on these arms. So clearly there's something that's, you know, we're still, we kind of get an inclination of what's happening here that may, perhaps we missed in the spreadsheet, but we still don't know the root cause, all right? So let's dig a little deeper. To make improvements, so we, we're getting an understanding of the results and, um, and a visual to help see these, these numbers. But now we are trying to say what's driving this and how, do we gonna, how are we gonna make it better? The tool provides additional information other than the results. We provide sensitivities, which are a measure of, you know, how much as this bushing flange thickness, you can see the white arrows on top of that coordinate system, as that gets bigger or smaller than a by a millimeter, the gap is gonna change by a millimeter. Right, and we have the same thing on the other side. So all of these distances are have a one-to-one -one relationship. That's kind of what I assumed in the spreadsheet. It, and the, the 0.5 has to do with you know going through diameters. But when we combine this information, well, I'll say real quickly, we also have sensitivities to angular sources of error, right? And that's something we did not, or I did not include in the spreadsheet. Well, let's see what's really driving it. So when we combine the sensitivities with tolerances, we get the contributions. And now we start to see what our top drivers for the width of this worst case variation are, or I could look at it statistically as well. <clears throat> so if I look at the, if I select the top one, you notice that it's a profile on the top plate to A. Feature one is this surface, A is the top, and it's the profile of that surface to the top that's the top contributor. Wait a minute. This is a vertical source of error. I didn't even include that in the spreadsheet, right? Everything I included was looking at translation this way, and this is telling me some surface that looks like it controls things vertically is the number one contributor. Well, let's dig it a little bit deeper and look at the variables associated with that. And now we see, well, that profile, it doesn't just control translation, it also controls the rotation of this surface, right? And what now it seems to be telling me, it's the rotation of that surface within this profile's tolerance zone of 0.5, that's causing 22% of the overall width here, okay? Now, as we look at this and kind of see the way the parts interact, it gets a little easier, it's pretty easy to understand, but if it weren't, if it were more complex, another tool that we have is called Visualize Sensitivities. And what this is gonna do is show me, and this animates as well, <clears throat> what happens to this support arm when the surface to which it attaches is machined, manufactured in some way at an angle within its tolerance zone. Again, we're looking at worst case here. So this is one limit to the other. And I can actually scale this up if uh, it wasn't quite so obvious visually right now. All right, so now that we understand what's going on, and first of all, we understand, okay, the spreadsheet didn't do that good of a job of capturing what's really happening with this assembly. And I would say the ability for this wheel to spin is a pretty, co pretty critical function. So let's start and looking at top tolerances here and start 
for now, reducing tolerances to make this better. There's other ways to get there, and I'll show you one in a later measurement. But right now, I'm just going to go to the default approach of, hey, too much variation at the assembly level. Let's reduce part level tolerances. And at this point, I could also in, add orientation controls, which might be a better approach, actually would be, because that's obviously what's more critical. But I'm just going to go in and say, let's just show you how I adjust tolerances as I make those changes, I reduce the variation. Notice as soon as I hit enter, the output updates. So I changed that from 0.5 to 0.2. It's now no longer a top contributor, and I have much less variation than before. Our next contributor is the 0.5 um, profile on, or, you know, on the bushing flange width. So let's say I do this to 0.3. And on the wheel, I have a 0.5 on the width. So again, I can do a 0.3. So very quickly, I'm able to go and make changes based upon the things that the tool is telling me are the leading contributors, the top contributors to the variation of interest. And as soon as I make that change, it's updating the results. The other thing that's happening behind the scene, I showed it earlier, I'll mention it again, because all of these tolerances have the green dot, they're all linked to SOLIDWORKS. So not only am I updating the results for me to see that it's improving the design, but it's actually making that change within the SOLIDWORKS annotation. So it's updating that tolerance value that was imported. Again, presuming that, that was shown on the drawing, it would be updating the tolerance value on the drawing as well. All right, so that's our first analysis. So we've gone through this process of kind of defining it, understanding the results, what it means, and using the information the tool provides to make improvements. Now, in this case, again, we were, we were making improvements that to reduce tolerances, and that will typically, it'll never make it cheaper. <laughs> well, if anything, it'll make it more expensive. But you're you're putting, if if that's the only way, you're letting the tool guide you on where to make that investment to make sure that when you when you have to pay more money, you're doing so in a way that actually is getting you, giving you the improvement that you, that you need. All right. Now, the, the nice thing about CE Toll is I've, I've gone through the process. I've shown you very quickly, in fact, probably more quickly than at least I could go put that spreadsheet together with the hands full of drawings of, of how to do this analysis. And we actually got you know, the tool provided to, with us, to, to us better information than the spreadsheet. And also we're exchanging data with SOLIDWORKS automatically. So there's no potential for a typo, an error when you know, moving it manually from the drawing into the spreadsheet and the spreadsheet back into SOLIDWORKS drawing or model, whichever. Or whichever. But the, the other really valuable thing about the tool is I've, I now have a model that defines how these parts interact with one another. And typically for our assemblies, we don't want to understand just one thing. There's a bunch of things that we need to, to we have questions about that we want to verify. Okay, so in this particular case, I'm going to add another measurement. I'm going to add the overall height. Let's say that, that we need to maintain this within, let's say, plus or minus 0.5 millimeters so that we ensure that when we attach four of these things underneath their whatever they're carrying, that there's not going to be too much variation and the whole thing is going to wobble back and forth. All right, so let's go do that. I go back to my assemble mode, I'll add measurement and I'll select the top surface and I'll select the diameter of the wheel. All right, so what did I say this was going to be? This is going to be height. And linear is fine, but visually, <laughs> Not quite what I had in mind. Now, hopefully, it's not what you depicted when I was describing what it is I was going to analyze. All right, easy enough. So the tool defaults is the closest distance between the two surfaces. Might be more helpful if I had chosen the bottom here and I wanted to make sure there's always going to be clearance if things were a little tighter. But I'm going actually going to the other side, so I'll just use the drop down to say I want to go to the far surface. All right, and I want to keep this within 110 plus or minus, which is the nominal value, 0.5 millimeters. All right, pretty straightforward. Now, the only things that, notice that the, the data for the diameter of the wheel and the top plate, again, came in automatically from 
from the annotations in the model. If they hadn't, then the only, the worst case scenario is I'd have to go for each each one, add a dimensioning scheme. So I, you know, if I went to, to some feature here in the tree and I needed to add a dimensioning scheme or geometric tolerance, I could do that right here. And so to, to add a second, third, and fourth analysis on top of work I've already done is extremely efficient. It's not a lot of work. Here we have a, a, a couple more things we need to do because remember earlier, we had these informational messages about clearance between the, uh, the these various diameters being ignored. Again, everything's centered by default. Well, it, we use the tools here to push these arms out initially. Now, if we think about how this thing's gonna function, well, presumably this is gonna be underneath something. The weight of it's gonna push the, the entire structure down onto the axle and the actual axle is gonna be pushed down to on top of the wheel. So we would expect contact between the axle and the bushing to be kind of at the top and between the axle and the wheel to be at the bottom. Let's go do that. Again, we wanna reorient our Y axes on all these joints to point in a single up or down direction, doesn't matter. And so again, here I'm gonna say this is positive Y because the contact is occurring um, at the top of the, of the uh, shaft against the, the bushing. <clears throat> go to the next message, do the same thing positive Y. And then lastly, here's the wheel to the to the axle. And this is actually going to be in the negative Y, right? Because the axle is going to be riding on the bottom of the hole in the wheel, right? If I have any questions about what I've done, I can check my, I, I can do a show locations here. This one is, these are pretty small tolerances. So I'm not going to see a lot. I'm not going to see a lot of movement here. Another way I can confirm what's happening is looking at what's changed in my solid nominal. So what had been modeled with clearance to be a perfect 110 is actually more likely gonna be 109.95 at nominal. So we're losing a little bit because of the fact that things are not gonna be perfectly aligned in the real world like we've put them in SOLIDWORKS, okay? Notice here too, I mentioned earlier that I may have some tolerance issues between the tolerance on the hole and the wheel and the shaft. I'm not gonna take care of that, but this is telling me that somewhere in that tolerance range, there may be a potential for the two to interfere. So this may be something I wanna go take care of. For the purpose of today's demonstration, I won't. We can now go and either solve all of them or just solve the one. I haven't made any changes that would negate or change the impact the, the results of the first. So I'll just solve the one and look at the results here. Statistically speaking, again, looks very good. Not quite as much margin statistically as we had with the um, the the the, uh, the gap, but not bad. Worst case, we're a little off over here. But the biggest thing I would say that we might want to go change is the fact that if we really wanted these to be on average 110 millimeters, and that's what our customers were expecting. And we now know that with the way these things are going to perform, that that they could be off you know, nominally. They're going to be a little bit less than that. But we might want to go look at what dimension or look at a change that would make this back to 110. And one of the areas that helps us understand where to make that change is the sensitivities. Right. So this will tell us the variables that influence that. And if in, in some cases, not for this simple analysis, but in more complex ones, some might actually be greater than so if you know greater than one it could be up in the one and a half or two range and those are interesting because you don't have to make as much of a change to those to get some amount of change in your output okay so i, I wanted to throw this one again it's not a uh you know it's not a particularly complex one it's just the fact that i was able to, to build upon the work that i had already done to do something that would still be several um elements in the, in the spreadsheet that I can go and quickly look at and very quickly deal with the fact that the clearance between some of the features, the shaft and the, and the bushings and the wheels, are going to cause a bias in the, in the nominal value that I might want to go understand and, and improve. All right. The next one's going to be a little bit more involved. Okay. So let's say another important aspect 
of this model <clears throat> is the ability or is to ensure that the wheel is going to roll in the direction that it is intended. And so I'm gonna assume that this back surface is the reference for you know how the thing mounts into whatever, the cabinet or whatever it's attaching to. So it, it's gonna kind of clock this part on this back surface. And so now I wanna keep the angular error of the wheel with respect to this reference to within half a degree, all right? But I don't want the assumption necessarily to be made that the arms are gonna be pushed out. I actually want to be a little bit more conservative and say, okay, <clears throat> um, with the clearance that's allowed between the clearance holes and the bolts, how much misalignment can occur? All right, so let's do that. I mentioned earlier, we have the capability to define additional assembly states. <coughs> like configurations, these assembly states reflect a combination of parts and joints, again, uh, mates in, in SOLIDWORKS, that I might wanna use for analysis. So if I, if I wanted to do a thread engagement analysis over here, I'd only need three parts. So I might just throw these three parts into an assembly state. In this particular one, I'm still gonna need all the parts. I'm just wanting to treat some joints differently. So I'm going to add a cloned state. I'm gonna copy the one I have now. And I'm gonna say, this is gonna be not arms pushed out, but arms floating. Okay. <clears throat> now, right now the two are identical. And I, let's go ahead and add the measurement while we're here. So I'm gonna add the measurement between, I think this is the, the back side. Yeah, that's datum B. And I'm going to go to this cylinder, the outer, D, outer diameter of the wheel, and all this can be renamed. Um, this, well, this is the, the wheel angle, right? That's what I'm calling this, or what, it's what I was describing. The angle of the wheel with respect to some reference on the, on the mounting surface of, of this entire subassembly. Well, again, the, the tool defaults to the closest distance between the two surfaces <laughs> might be interesting, but that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for an angular error. And I want to measure that around a vertical axis. So again, visually, what I'm seeing is I want to measure the, it's looking at the outward normal of the plate versus the axis of the wheel, the OD of the cylinder, of the wheel. So that's, that's 90 degrees. That's why it's giving me that value by default. All right. And I said, I want to keep this within half a degree. All right. But again, I want this to be with the arms floating. So I'm going to collapse my tree to look at just my joints because it's the joints I want to change. And I'm going to go look at the joints that I had biased um, the, to, be, to, to push the arms out and to say, I, don't want to, I want something different now. So the joint I had before, I'm going to exclude from this assembly state. I'm going to make a copy or clone, and I'm gonna change the copy to say floating, okay? I'm gonna do this for all of them. I'll do it for here. I'll, ex again, exclude, clone, and then define that as floating. <clears throat> Working my way down, you notice that as I select anything from the tree, visually I see what I've selected, so make sure that I don't have to rem remember exactly the placement of these. I can just l click it see what highlights, get that visual feedback that I've selected the right thing and, and go. So last one, exclude, clone, and float. Pretty straightforward. All right, still have that potential interference down here. Again, that's something I would look at later. Good to know. Let's go ahead and run this one. Actually, let me go ahead and do all three. So now when I hit solve, I'm gonna recalculate everything. Notice it's telling me here are all the measurements and as I add more and more, they're gonna to continue to grow. <clears throat> Go through the, the sensitivities very quickly of all three. And we get the results for this wheel angle. I'll view the results. Oh, that's not good. Nowhere near where I wanted to be. Worst case, of course, worst case is gonna be out a lot if you have anything involving multiple uh, dimensions. Uh, you, well, I will leave that for another conversation, but you know, as you get more and more contributions, and if I look at this, uh, at the worst case, there are a lot of things contributing here. So the likelihood of all this happening at once is, is probably pretty small. <clears throat> but even statistically, um, things are not that great. 
right? Here's my quality metrics, CPK of 0.5, uh, 1.5 sigma, yield of 0.8762. And let's look at percent yield just to have something a little bit better. So I'm gonna go to my, instead of saying yield, let's do percent. So 87.6%, okay, give a few more digits. 12 to 13% of our assemblies are not gonna meet this requirement. So all these carts that these things get attached to are gonna have what I call the shopping cart effect, right? You're trying to push it straight, it's wanting to go off to the right or left. That's not good. And we're all frustrated when that happens. So let, let's see if we can make it better. All right, how good do we need it? Well, let's get, at least get to a CP of one, right? Yeah, that's kind of the, the standard assumption and I could make this bigger. And so whatever I want had as my desired quality, I'm gonna ignore worst case for now because we're not gonna get their worst case, but I'm gonna try to get there statistically. So if I am doing statistical analysis, I wanna understand a desired quality level, I could put that in and get um, the limits of my distribution at my desired quality level, just to give me feedback on, as I make these improvements, where, where things are, okay? If I look at the contributions, let's use this again to help us understand what's driving the variation. I select this and I notice that it's a variable under the joint, right? So this is the floating variable that I, I turned on earlier, that we made this assembly state to represent. And so the fact that this thing floats randomly is a pretty good contributor to what is happening here. If we don't quite understand that, let's do a visualized worst case, because this is kind of interesting. Um, there's there's actually quite a bit going on here. So to see the general nature of the error. So basically we're having mislocation of the arms and the bushings, the shaft going through them. And when, again, worst case is very extreme, but you kind of see here the general contribution to the general nature of the sources of error and the impact they're having on, on your requirement. So the hole is the biggest issue, right? Now, how do we how do we make the hole? How do we how do we avoid that? Well, if I hide the top plate real quick, I'll come in and just show you that these holes are oversized quite a bit. They're ten and a half millimeters nominal on an M10 thread, and the reason they are is for worst case fit, right? So we're we're really focused on making sure that the bolts can always go through the holes. But in doing so, we're putting so much potential misalignment in the system to, to, to guarantee fit that we're not getting the performance we need out of the wheel. And that's a problem. All right, and there's several ways that we could go about resolving this now. Um, we could look at alignment plates. There, there's several things that we can do. What I'm gonna do is recognize that when I have, well, even when I have a pattern, but in this case, I have two bolts in, in two clearance holes right now. Well, a lot of times when we want more precision alignment, we use dowel pins and we put them in a hole in a slot. I don't want to put pins in this. Uh, that seems it might be necessary if I can't get there anyways. But let's see if we can use that whole slot combination to improve this without having to add additional hardware and you know, really precise holes and slots. So to do that, I can, of course, go into SOLIDWORKS, make the changes there, reopen CTOL. We, we track the, not only the tolerances, but we track nominal changes you make to ge geometry. But um, before I do that, I wanna do a what if scenario, right? What if I take this hole down to just above the M10 size and, and account for positional variation by making this a slot? Okay, I can actually simulate that directly within CTOL. And I can do that by, <clears throat> excuse me, breaking. I don't wanna change anything just yet. I'll break the link on the size dimension for this hole and I'll change it to limits to go not from 10 and a half with whatever this range is. I'm gonna go from 10, which is just above, uh, M10 threads will never be quite at 10 millimeters, they're gonna be slightly under, to 10.2. And I made a note that I need to, need to reduce the hole size. Okay, in, in SOLIDWORKS. So I'm, I'm doing a what if study right now. Same thing here. Um, I will <clears throat> break the link. I'll say a note, this is gonna change the slot for this analysis to be valid. And I'll do the same thing I had over here. I'll say limits from lower limit of 10 to an upper limit of 10.2. I'm actually giving it more tolerance. I think I had 0.17 millimeters total tolerance range. And now I'm telling it there's two total millimeters total tolerance range. So 
it might actually be cheaper to do this. Now the slot is going to drop up a little cost. It's not as easy as a hole, but there's less tolerance. There's more tolerance. But notice that as soon, as quickly as I've made those changes, again the results updated. I had a CP of one as my as the plus or minus green bars as a requirement. Well, I've exceeded my my target by just taking those two round clearance holes and taking one to a slot and the other one as being smaller, I'm able to control the alignment of these axles or the support arms with each other and, and then hence the what they how they interact with the axle better than I even needed to. And I see that immediately as soon as I make those changes. Okay. So last thing, let's go ahead and generate a quick report because now that we're done, we want to kind of communicate this to other people and document our work. Now, of course, at this point, I would actually go in <coughs> and um, go in and, and uh, make the changes to SOLIDWORKS to, to that last one, right, uh, before I ran the report, because I would want to presumably do it on the, on the final design. But for the sake of time, I'll just go ahead and run it now. The report is from our analyzer. Uh, this is a kind of a tabular presentation of the data. It's beyond the scope of a conversation today, but it, it presents all the same data in a different way. There's it's a lot of neat things you can do here, but I'll quickly generate a report. There's different templates. You can create new templates. I'm gonna use one that's been previously saved and let's go with that. So here's the quick report generated from the results that we've been doing, the gap, the results, the top contributors, Right, so we're using this to improve the design. You know, quality might be real interested in this because if you want to ensure that this is being maintained on every unit that ships, I could of course do 100% inspection at the assembly level or I could put SPC controls in place around the processes that are generating these features and know that as long as these are under control, this will be as well. Because I, I now completely understand that these are the items that drive variation in that distance. And this gets repeated for every measurement we've defined across every assembly state. <clears throat> and at the bottom, we show part level details. So here's some information about the parts, showing the annotations that were used, and then the different features. I'd, I'd typically go in and and uh, name these things a little bit you know, more clear instead of feature nine, feature eight, feature seven. But I did want to note that the notes that we captured to the, that we needed to change will appear in the report. So if you neglected to change the SOLIDWORKS models and, and take these notes away, then you will see that in a report. So the, the notes are all throughout the system. They're very valuable in kind of making notes to yourselves or to others for follow-up actions or something that just to be documented. We actually recommend that people document the measurements uh, that they define as to why they're being done. Why, why were the spec limits chosen? Anything that, that can help somebody else looking at your work you know, six months from now, perhaps when something happens in, in production, that could help them see why you did what you did. Go ahead and put a, a quick note in there and it becomes part of the, the permanent design record. Again, by default, this stuff gets saved into the SOLIDWORKS models. All right, so we've gone through the software. I have a couple more slides before we conclude today's call. Of, okay, this is all great, you know, right? We've, we've generated a report, we've kind of, we're done with the design. How can I, is this valuable to me? I mentioned, you know, putting notes in there for somebody, <clears throat> maybe a manufacturing support engineer to, to have access to when things arise in manufacturing where this might be helpful. Well, what are some of those scenarios? On the left, I list three common ones, and on the right, I show details for one of them. So first of all, uh, inevitably, when when you know things start getting made, uh, you, you want to, of course, use the tool appropriately and, and try to get the tolerances as loose as possible to begin with. But in the event that something happens and, and manufacturing is having a particular issue with a particular tolerance and a particular feature, then they can provide that feedback and you can go into the tool and say, okay, let's see what happens if, if we give them more tolerance here and better you know, understand the, very, the variation they're actually getting and maybe reallocate, right? Maybe we can, you know, if they can hold something else in that contribution list tighter than what you assumed, then you can shift things around. So it, it can certainly help you understand where you can make those types of changes probably the number one request for manufacturing, <laughs> less tolerances. And the nice thing with the tool is <clears throat> if you use it correctly initially, 
what we recommend is putting your block tolerances or something that you deem easily manufacturable all day long and let the tool tell you where they need to be tighter as I showed you today. And, and so that what you're giving the manufacturer does represent what is needed in order for the design to work. Again, you can still use it later uh, to, to reallocate and shift some tolerance from one part to the other and, and so forth. Second bullet, quickly make uh, use, uh, use scrap decisions. So inevitably as engineers, we get the question, hey, I've got a batch of parts, uh, things aren't right. There's some of them out of spec, can I use them or not? You can actually take that data, put it back into the system and get a, a, a real assessment based on the output of the risk of using those those parts and, and then have quantitative data to make that uh, decision to either use as is or scrap them, assuming rework's not, not an option. And then lastly, and this is what I've documented on the right, change the lower cost vendors where possible. So it's easy to go in and evaluate different parts or features of parts coming in at different CP levels or different quality levels and combine that with different costs for the different parts coming from different vendors. So here's just a quick example <clears throat> where we have, <coughs> we're using parts from three different, we're, we're trying out or, or looking at evaluating three different suppliers for a particular part in this assembly. You see the predicted defects with each of those based upon their, their quality levels, uh, the unit cost, the scrap cost, and, and beneath that you see kind of the results of the output of the, the typical measurement at the assembly level for using each. And then you could put that into a, a spreadsheet and say, okay, let's do a cost assessment. And what's my overall cost for going with company A, company B, and company C? Right. And in this case, the the over the company A, which wasn't the cheapest, but not the most expensive, it was in the middle in terms of the unit cost, was deemed overall to have the lower of the three costs by a small margin for this one. All right. So I appreciate your time today. Um, we you know, welcome any questions you have. I, I will say that you, if you want more information about our company, our software, whether it be CE Tall or something else you saw today, please don't hesitate to reach out and talk to us. Uh, our www.sigmetrics.com is our website. And here's the screen that you'll see uh, with regards to the information on the SOLIDWORKS version of CETOL. With that, I will open it up for any questions you might have. I, Nicole, I assume everybody is unmuted. I think I heard that you took it off mute. Any? Yes, at this time, if you have any questions, please use the question panel and the GoToWebinar um, tool as we okay. have our listeners on mute at the, uh, for the oh. duration of the presentation. Okay. So I see Roberto has, uh, hand raised. Um, uh, uh, Roberto? Uh, yes. There is going to be a webinar from uh, PTC Creo? Or only, yes. Yeah? Uh, there's a, another webinar uh, that we've worked on with uh, PTC um, in a few weeks talking about some new product offerings there. All right, just to join because I use uh, already CETL for PTC and oh, okay. it's very amazing. Yeah, I already took the training with you guys. Okay. So I, I saw that you're right. going to have right. this webinar too, just to join. Right. Well, thank you for joining. Right. Bye. Okay, so uh, there was a question when solving, you used first order approximation. What does second order evaluate differently? Um, great question. So the second order option is dealing with the response curve between the measurement, which is considered the output variable, and each of the variation sources the, as the input variables. In most tolerance analysis, that relationship at least, or in most systems, that relationship at least within the realm that we do tolerance analysis, so we're looking at minor variations of input dimensions, is very linear in nature. Um, However, as you go much, much further away, sometimes it can be nonlinear. In some cases, though, 
<clears throat> in particular cases, especially if you're dealing with things that are very small and the tolerance represents a large percentage of the nominal, it can actually be nonlinear and have a, a, a significant curve in that response curve. The second order um, calculations take those types of effects into account. They also look at the interactions between variables. <clears throat> so if the value, <clears throat> excuse me, of, of one variable influences the sensitivity of the measurement to another, that would be captured in that second order analysis. <coughs> in most cases, it's not needed, but as an advanced tool, we're, you know, we're, we're looking at, at making sure we can provide, we're, we're very much focused on ease of use to, to let, you know, provide this to as many users as possible. But at the same time, there's a lot of things within it that are quite powerful and looking at very, uh, let's say, unique or, or specific situations. <clears throat> Any other questions? And you can feel free to raise your hand or um, type it into the question box. All right. Well, I guess with that, we will end the, the call. Thank you very much again for your time today. Uh, hopefully you uh, got something out of it. It was helpful and beneficial for you in understanding uh, what the capabilities of the software were. Thank you and have a great day.